Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Mapping the Optimal Supply Chain for Biologics from Formulation to Clinic. My name is Sumaya and I'll be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode. Please also note that this event will be recorded and made available for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Sharp Clinical who developed the content for this presentation. Sharp, part of UDG Healthcare, is a global leader in contract pharmaceutical packaging and advanced clinical supply chain services, offering solutions and support to pharma and biotech clients from phase one trials all the way through to rapid launch and commercialization. The organization has state-of-the-art facilities in the United States, United Kingdom, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and over 32 clinical depots globally, covering every region of the world. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's event, and our first speaker is Sasha Sonnenberg. Sasha Sonnenberg joined Sharp Clinical in September 2019 as Global Head of Business Development, supporting Sharp's strategy for growth in the clinical trial market. Before joining Sharp, he held management positions at Markin and Fable Pharma Services, overseeing global operations and business development activities. Sonnenberg is an active member of the ISP Community of Practice on Investigational Products, where he's a co-author of the Good Practice Guide for Booklet Labels in Clinical Trials, and currently leads a task, task team developing a Good Practice Guide on Patient-Centric Logistics Direct to Patient Services. And our second speaker is Andrea Wagner. Dr. Andrea Wagner is a co-founder of Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing. She successfully grew the company to an industry leader in small batch sterile fill finish by effectively developing unique isolator-based flexible fillers to fulfill an unanswered demand in the market. Her role today involves closely monitoring the coordination of engineering, quality, manufacturing, and project management teams to meet the constantly changing customer requirements and critical deadlines, managing sales and client relationships, and effecting, effecting pivotal decisions to the growth of the company to meet market needs. So now, without further ado, I'll pass control to our first speaker, and that's Sasha. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, um, thanks um, Shumaya for the very kind introduction and um, warm up for today's webinar. I hope that um, everybody can see my screen um, and we will go to the first couple of slides before I hand over to Andrea and then um, you have the pleasure to, to welcome me back for the remaining slides. Um, yeah, talking about the optimal supply chain for your biologics from formulation to clinic, um, we, we see more and more biologics coming into clinical trials and of course also into commercial stage and before we move forward I want to make sure we are talk, looking at what we will cover today. So we will start with a brief industry overview. I will keep it really short but just to bring everybody up to speed where we stand in regards to biologics and um, um, commercialization. We will talk about the elements of the traditional supply chain, um, what to look out for, what kind of challenges you might face and how to prepare and how to overcome them. 
and then how to identify the right partner and what is very important also to um, being open to collaborate with your partner and to engage them at an early stage. So let's have a look at the um, annual global drug sales. Um, when you look here at the graph on the left, um, you see the development of um, drug sales between 2016 and up to 2024. We see that biotech products um, increase as well as other pharma products. But what is important here is that in terms of um, value, um, the biologic drugs are having a dominating um, position among global blockbusters. Uh, we know that 15 um, of the top selling prescription drugs in 2018 or 10 of them were biologics and overall 53% um, of the top 100 selling prescription and OTC products in 2018 were biotech products. Some of them are named here. So we see that there is um, a huge market and what is important also when we look here to the next slide is um, looking at the biologics value chain and um, what is making the biologic supply chain um, so unique and um, how it is impacting also clinical supplies. What you see here on the table is on the left, the traditional medicine, small molecule drug supply chain, and I will not go into the details here. In the middle, we have the modern biologics, and on the right, what has started and seen a huge development over the last three to five years, um, the cell and gene therapy market. But we will focus today on the modern biologic supply chain. Um, we saw already on the previous slide that from a value perspective, the biologics are on the top of the, of the graphs and um, in a leading position. And this is because that um, the therapy on an annual basis on average costs 100,000 um, or even more. It's used mainly for chronic diseases, uh, personalized, um, generally multi-treatments are coming and um, it is something where um, when you go into the development um, and you, um, you have the product, it's more difficult to handle in general. This is because we are dealing here very often with living organisms, uh, with cells. Um, what we see as well is that um, the volumes in general are going down. On the other side, the number of batch um, processes or manufactured batches are actually increasing and because of the nature of the product um, we see a lot of requirements from a cold chain perspective which is making the global distribution especially at the stage of the clinical trial and also the warehousing more challenging as you need to maintain strict temperature requirements and need to establish um, and sometimes qualify validate solutions from packaging, shipping, and distribution to the site. Um, and there are also a lot of um, track and trace technologies that potentially can be used in order to make your life easier and to gain real-time access to the data of the drug that you are distributing. If you look to some of the challenges that we see um, currently, uh, we realize that um, protocols are becoming more complex. And this is also something when we look to the current situation where we are in a um, pandemic situation caused because of COVID-19. Um, there are discussions if it is a chance to simplify things or um, if protocols might become more complex. Um, and um, at the moment, in order to mitigate risks, um, what, what I see is that um, protocols are actually becoming more complex. Uh, lead times to enroll patients are becoming shorter. Um, you have a lot of different country-specific regulations when it comes for the, um, about the, the, or to the import um, of product. Um, dealing with multiple languages um, with, again, the, the regulations that come along with the different countries um, getting approval um, to, to use your label text. Um, 
very often with these kind of new drugs, there is a lack of experience because there's no real historical data. Um, the cold chain management also, we have seen um, a fast and, and really pleasing development in terms of um, technical solution when it comes to, to shippers and loggers. Um, we still see issues in this area and especially um, with the global vaccine distribution potentially absorbing a lot of cold chain capacity, um, there is a certain challenge there as well moving forward. Um, general logistics, um, not just because of the, the um, situation we face with COVID, but um, um, logistics, there can always be interruptions and with the sensitive product, um, such as the biologics, this can always be a challenge. Um, and another challenge is, of course, also cross-vendor management. Um, having multiple vendors involved um, because you might not um, find one that can provide all services. Managing all of them, assuring the communication across them is working well, um, is something that can be a challenge and can consume a lot of your time and of your budget. So looking into um, the clinical trial supply road, and it is a road that can be a very smooth road, but it can also be a very bumpy road. And I think the, the key takeaways for today that we want to um, share with you here and hopefully have as an outcome of today's webinar is um, um, what you need to do in order to, to plan to find your right service provider and to make the road as smooth and um, um, not as curvy as this one, but straight and, and make it an easy ride. Um, so we will go through the different stages, uh, planning and preparation, um, analytical and formulation, manufacturing and primary packaging, where I will hand over soon to Andrea. And I will then cover again the secondary packaging part, going, looking more detailed into storage and distribution and execution and review. And with that, I will hand over to Andrea, who will now take the BSM part. Thank you, Sasha, for the kind introduction. Um, just so folks know, um, Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing is a drug production uh, company. We are a fill finish company that provides sterile filling and formulation using isolator based technology and flexible fillers. And by flexible fillers, we can fill syringes, vials, and cartridges. So um, I'm going to be speaking about the drug product production side of the business. And some of the takeaways here are. Um, how to find the best CMO, the typical timing required, and what you can do as a sponsor of a CMO to um, have a smooth transition once you found your perfect match for your CMO. So let's talk a little bit about the drug product um, process and how it works. So let's pretend that you're trying to find the right life partner. And when doing so, you might ask questions such as, what are your interests? How do you like your coffee? What do you, where do you like to go to dinner? Um, these are things that you're trying to get to know the other party and determine whether this would be a great fit for the long term. Well, in a CMO, you need to do the same thing. Uh, you need to look at, you need to ask a lot of questions and you need to know what questions to ask. And so we're gonna give you those tools. And then once you find that perfect fit, um, you're gonna evaluate the CMO with a request for information or request for proposal and you're going to collect those quotes and then you're going to pick your CMO. Uh, but there's a little bit more involved there and we're going to give you some tools in um, which to uncover the best partner so that you can find your perfect match. But prior to making that choice, you should understand this process and gather the data that's required and provide the correct timing. So, but before going on, we'd like to um, do a poll question. And this question is, what are your greatest concerns when looking for a fill finish CMO? Thank you, Andrea. So 
audience members, you should be seeing that poll question on your screens. So like Andrea mentioned, that question is, what, what is your greatest concern when looking for a full finished CMO? And your options are as follows, the quality system sterility assurance, or that's meeting your timeline, or that's container flexibility, or that could be cost, or it's other. So you can go ahead and vote on that poll just by clicking on the option that suits you best. And once again, that question is, what is your greatest concern when looking for a full finished CMO? Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer that. I see that we're almost there. Majority of audience members are almost voting. Perfect. So let's go ahead and close the poll. And the results are as follows. Okay, so you should be seeing the results on your screens. And so the majority of votes went to the quality system sterility assurance, which was at 56%, followed by meeting your type timeline at 33%, and then cost at 7%, other at 4%, and lastly, no votes went to container flexibility. So back to you, Andrea, I'll send back control to you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, the quality systems and sterility assurance, number one, not surprising. Uh, meeting your timeline, number two. Um, <clears throat> all right, so going back to our perfect match, you're looking for the right CMO, and how do you do that? How do you get there? So we're gonna help you with that. Um, as a CMO, the questions that are posed to us are typically listed here. Um, when you're looking for a CMO, you should consider what you need. So for example, do you need an immediate need, timing, is that important to you? Um, what do you need the next two years? So the relationship here that you're choosing is a long-term relationship. It's typically not a short-term. Um, so ideally, you want the CMO to take you at least two years out, um, and you need to look at their quality and what the timing is again, and things like analytical testing. Do you need that transferred formulation? Is it difficult or is it easy? Uh, label kitting distribution, do you, is your CMO have those attributes? Do they have a partner like Sharp that can uh, perform that for you? These are the types of questions that um, you might wanna be asking. And the CMO, the contract manufacturing organization is likely to ask you a lot of questions. So they might ask you things like your timing because their calendar may be full for nine months and you may need it in three months. Um, what is your lot size? So your lot size meaning how many vials, syringes, or cartridges you might like to produce in one given lot. Um, if you're looking to do say 50,000 and the CMO you're talking to can only do 20,000, that might be a problem for you. You might not be able to uh, cut that down. The toxicity of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. This is a really important one. A lot of people um, kind of breeze over that. So a lot of CMOs um, have certain requirements for certain types of products and that should be a question um, right up front. Do you handle uh, DEA classified substance, do you handle a toxicity of greater than um, three or a cytotoxic product if you ha should have one? And maybe that's important from you, for you as well. If you don't have a cytotoxic product, do you want to manufacture in a facility that handles those types of products? So those are considerations. How is your formulation done? Um, is it easy or does it require three days of complex uh, manipulations? Uh, other things like filling, is your product light sensitive, oxygen sensitive, temperature sensitive? Can we accommodate for those? In what phase are you at? Are you in a phase one uh, trial or are you going into commercial? Are you in phase three? Do you need uh, future capacity uh, very quickly? So these are things that you should consider as you're starting to um, develop that list. And in finding the best fit, both parties must be compatible. So it's not a situation of, oh, I found the best fit, but the CMO 
is not compatible with you, meaning if you're getting um, um, information back that doesn't seem like it's gonna fit, that's an important aspect to consider. Um, speak to the internal people, such as the process engineering group, um, the quality control group, the qual quality assurance group, and the manufacturing. If timing is tight, make sure to speak with the materials folks and the planner um, to get accurate information about that. And finally, QA, quality assurance, is the backbone of the decision, as we've um, identified here during the poll. They must be able to work together. So if there's personality issues between the quality groups, that is going to be a big problem later on. So that needs to be resolved up front and should be a um, high criteria. So let's talk about um, the struggles in finding the right CMO. So in understanding the drug product production process is going to help you create that list of questions that you can then um, tackle with your potential CMOs. So let's map it out. We'll enable you to get a better understanding of the process, important aspects, you need to determine the container. So if you're looking to fill vials, and I'm sorry, you, if you're looking to fill syringes and your CMO only does vials, then that's gonna be a problem. Uh, QC testing transfer. How rugged does that need to be? Does it need to happen? Are you doing your QC elsewhere? Does the CMO require you to do certain things internally? These are things that you need to ask about. Formulation, again, easy or complex? And how much experience do they have if it is complex? And by the way, on the materials, um, the equipment required for more complex formulations, most CMOs don't have um, multi-use containers anymore, so this is something you should consider as well. Sterilizing method. Do you need sterile filtration al along with steam sterilization? Is everything aseptic? If you're terminally sterilizing and you don't need aseptic um, um, control around your production, then you shouldn't be paying for it, um, and you're probably at the wrong CMO. Filling needs. What type of fillers? Um, do you, do you require? I noticed that nobody looked at flexibility in filling, but some people want, may want to start in a vial and go to a syringe. Does your CMO have the capability to change over? All right, so now let's look at the approach. So when you're looking at a CMO, there's three stages on the drug product production side. Um, so there's a planning and preparation, then you have a really quick execution stage, and then finally you have a release stage. So uh, let's look at the different groups involved. So there's five critical groups, process engineering, quality control, materials group, QA, and manufacturing. These are all headed up by one person, the coach, which is the project manager. Uh, some CMOs may have a project manager that can um, speak for all of these groups. Um, however, I think it is important to be able to get in touch with the SME and inside of each of these groups. So that might be a question that you might ask when you're doing your evaluation. On the planning and prep side, so let's break this out. So here we are at the planning prep. That can take a bit of time. And let's talk about what each of these group members do. So the process engineering group is going to take your formulation and they're going to transfer that um, information into documents. They might do studies for you, they're going to write your batch record in um, collaboration with all of these other groups, um, but that is their role in um, transferring your pr product in for production. On the quality control side, the QC side, they're going to be looking at doing method transfers if you have a validated method or qualification if you do not. Um, they're going to perform your in-process and final release testing. They're also going to be in charge of releasing the materials and the chemicals that go into your uh, product as well as the containers. So these are important people to get to know. On the materials group, they're going to be ordering everything um, for your production, and they're going to assist with the material specs, and they're going to assist with the release and the kitting of that, uh, of that material, and we call um, at Berkshire Sterling, anyway, we call that um, piece of paper the bill of materials, the bomb. Um, so their role is pretty important as well. And then on the quality assurance side, this is, again, the backbone of the organization, and they're going to be reviewing all the records, and they're going to be signing off. They're the last sign off on everything. So being able to make sure that they can do sufficient review and work with your team as well, because you're going to be signing off too. 
Now, we go to the execution. As I stated before, this is the quick phase. Usually, it lasts about a week. Uh, the teams involved, again, are the four, process engineering, manufacturing, quality control, and quality assurance. Uh, your project manager, manager will be leading you through. So the process engineers will assist in the formulation, at least to start with, until it becomes uh, a normal process, meaning usually it takes uh, two to three times before um, manufacturing takes over. But they're always there in the background um, doing, being the coach, the overseer of it. On the manufacturing side, um, there's four groups. So there's a component prep group, a formulation group, a fill finish group, and then an inspection group. And they're, they're basically the worker bees in terms of making sure that your product is formulated correctly, it's documented, it's filled appropriately. Um, and by the way, I should have mentioned that some of the, all the video that you're seeing here is in-house the Berkshire Sterile. Um, and um, it's filled correctly and then it's inspected. On the qu quality control side, th they'll be in charge during the execution phase of your in-process really testing. So, and I highly recommend that you make this in process testing as easy as possible. So a pH test is ideal um, or a UV analysis. Once you get into doing HPLC analysis, it can be a little bit tricky and it can delay a fill if there's an issue uh, with the standardization prior to do, running the test. So we encourage um, simple is better during that period of time. And then quality assurance they really need to be on the floor. Um, so they need to be checking to make sure the records are being filled out at the time of, um, at the time that the work is being performed. Uh, they need to be available to ensure that um, if there's any issue that they can escalate that. Um, their role is very, very important at this stage as well. Now, we go on to the release. Now we notice we dropped that off one of our team members, the process engineers. Um, we have a review and release process that usually lasts four to six weeks after um, the production is completed. In manufacturing, they're going to be doing the inspection. It should be a 100% inspection. Um, sometimes this is automated. Most of the time it's not. Um, so that is an important aspect. The quality control group is going to be doing the release testing and issuing the C of A, the Certificate of Analysis. And the quality assurance group is going to be reviewing all of the records and closing out any discrepancies uh, related to the production and then issuing a CFC, which is a certificate of compliance. So those are all of the team members involved in the production of the um, drug product. Now, once that's completed, then it goes off to, at least in our case, to our partner Sharp. Um, to be kitted and distributed and off to the patient. Now, as mentioned before, we need to think about timing. So uh, this will vary from client to client and CMO to CMO, but you should definitely expect from the date after the contract is signed, a six month process to get from the beginning to the end. A lot of people require more, it could be nine months. There's things that can get in the way of this, like materials, uh, reference standards, long lead times um, should be considered API. Um, so you should um, think very carefully about that. Now, if you're starting now, you might be sitting there thinking, oh my God, I, I have to have my production done in four months. So timing is gonna be much more critical for you than um, some of the other aspects that we've mentioned, or at least as critical as some of the other aspects that we've mentioned. So starting early is really important in this process. And we all, and this is often the group that's thought about last. So now, how can you make it? Once you find that perfect match, you're going to be with the CMO for a while. Um, could be two years, could be ten. So please uh, consider that. How can you make it a smooth transition to the CMO? What can you do? So in real estate, they talk about location, 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 and the CMO industry, we talk about communication, communication, communication. So in any good relationship, communication is key. And in the DP process that I've just outlined here, 
it's important to understand that you might have many members of your team talking to many members of the other team. So setting up a successful communication process is important. The project manager really should be the uh, person that holds all communication, or at least copies of communication. So, and putting it in writing, especially if it's important, like your uh, specifications, which you own as the drug sponsor, is really critical to ensuring that you have successful transfer. Okay, let's go over some things that you should do. So, before you sign up for that contract, you want to review the technical, um, quality, and timing aspects and make sure all of your questions are addressed. Okay? Um, and the contract itself could be uh, a longer process as well, depending on the uh, legal ease of the organization that you're dealing with. Um, you want to ask as many questions as possible and you want to feel comfortable with all of those questions. Now you know some of the questions to ask too. So during stage one, the planning and prep, you want to make sure that your formulation is robust. So, and your methods. So if you have development that needs to be done and you want the CMO to do that, you need to communicate that to them. So they don't put it into their planning process and run into roadblocks, which further delays you in the future. Um, you want to make sure that you provide thorough details on how you formulate this right up front before, before it's even quoted. This is how it's uh, formulated. If you're going from a 50 mil uh, beaker to a two liter process or a one liter to a hundred liter, it's a huge step and you're going to require some um, formulation transfer and some studies to be able to um, transition that up. And you may do that internally, or you may do that at the CMO. Again, something you need to convey to them. Um, make sure that the specifications can be met. Um, don't transfer specifications to the CMO or ask the CMO what the specifications for your product should be because they don't know. Um, but make sure that you know that they can be met and with confidence. And give a quick thorough review of all the quality documents. You own them as much as the CMO does. The CMO owns them, you own them. They're part of your process going forward. They will be inspected by regulators. It is important that you give them enough uh, time for review. And avoid last minute changes. This is the death of all um, products in my opinion. When um, clients or CMOs come in and say, oh, we need to make this uh, change the minute before it starts. Try and avoid that. Now, on the execution stage, what can you do? You can get the batch record approved, I say a few days. I would like a few weeks uh, prior to the fill date to prevent deviations. If people can uh, prepare properly, you're going to get less deviations on the actual run. Um, have the engineers in the formulation ensure that they're properly training the manufacturing group. Be part of that process. You, you are the owner of this uh, production. They, you need to make sure that the information is being conveyed not only in written form, but also in verbal form to the people that are going to be handling your um, production. And then be available, finally. Uh, if your fill goes into midnight, 1 a.m. in the morning, um, you're going to have to stay up late to be part of that. In these times of COVID, uh, they should have remote um, viewing available to you. And you should be available if they need to get in touch with you in case there's an issue. This is um, critically important. All right, so in review, um, finding the right CMO, the perfect fit. We went over the timing and the expectations and what you could do to ensure that the transfer, once you do find that perfect fit, goes seamlessly because we don't want to be in a situation where, like most of us, we hire contractors and we really don't like them after um, they get our job done. So we want to like our CMO at the end. And this is what we can all do to work better together. Um, now, I would like to um, switch it back over to Sharp and they can talk to you about what you do after you get your drug product produced and it goes to them. Thank you very much, um, Andrea, for the um, good overview and how you manage the, the production and filling part. Um, 
I hope the transition to my presentation or back to my presentation went well. Mm -hmm. Yep, Sasha, we can see that. Okay, perfect. As Andrea mentioned, um, I think a, a element or the, one of the most critical element is communication um, and managing expectations and understanding um, the situation, the CMO, but also the client is in. So I think asking questions is a very important part to make sure that you get a good understanding about the requirements, capabilities, um, and you see here a couple of examples um, that we typically um, receive. There are, of course, many, many more, and I will not go through the details here. But um, some of the, I think, important questions are, um, is, of course, the inspection about regulatory agencies. Um, how flexible are you and can you meet our timelines and demands? And I, I always like this question because to me, it always comes back um, uh, with another question is, um, okay, we need to have information that are usually not available then. And so it's really about um, communicating and being open. Um, Andrea mentioned the part, um, having people in the plant, um, not face to face maybe at the moment to observe manufacturing, but have you set up virtual capacity or capabilities um, what kind of technologies do you have to support um, the primary, secondary packaging, the labeling? Uh, can you do this under different temperature conditions, for example? Um, audit and quality um, specific questions, obviously, and in the times of the pandemic also, do you have the cap um, capabilities to perform a virtual audits? How can we review documents? Do you have a virtual site tour? Um, these are all questions that we receive. And um, over the last couple of months, of course, also, um, how do you um, or how are you prepared to mitigate um, the Brexit impact? Um, do you have um, 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 distribution or packaging capacities within the EU? And on the other side, of course, um, um, what are actions in place to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 so that your packaging run, but also the distribution of the material to the clinic or to the patient is not in danger. On the other side, um, the CMO might have a lot of questions as well. Yeah? And uh, we are always uh, asked by our colleagues and project management and productionists uh, at the very early stage um, to request an, an SDS to classify the material to see if we can handle it. And on the other side, we know that uh, this kind of information is not always available. What kind of um, blinding strategy do you have? Is it an open label study or is it a blinded, maybe even double blinded study? Um, timelines again. Yeah? When is your first patient in date is always a very good indicator. And um, sometimes it is or might even be a challenge when you look at the first patient in date and then you see it's only four weeks away and you have to perform a full packaging and distribution exercise. Um, volumes, how many campaigns do you run? Uh, what kind of services are overall required? Um, are there any special requirements? Um, not necessarily child resistant senior friendly, but um, maybe in the post COVID world, we will see more adherence packaging, which will add complexity. Uh, we'll talk about labeling. Uh, sometimes it looks like a sim simple sticker, but there are many uh, requirements um, related to materials and of course to the text um, that you put on the label. When we talk about biologics, um, the temperature is a very critical element. Usually we have um, temperature uh, requirements around two to eight, but they can always be uh, also be in the negative environment. Um, so identifying the right solution for uh, packaging needs to be under certain conditions in case you have limited um, stability data um, and what kind of solution and also service partner you use for the distribution are critical here. Um, and then which countries are um, included in your study. Um, very important because it will have a huge impact on the timeline, not necessarily from the shipping, but um, obtaining um, required documents um, is a very critical point and understanding really how long does it take 
and um, I hope we have, don't have too many people from clinical operations, but uh, I've seen it in the past very often. And Oh yeah, we add another country, uh, we can start distribution tomorrow. This is usually not how it works. And there's a lot of preparation. You might want to look into mapping out the distribution um, channel. And again, you need to obtain import licenses, permits, um, and that might in some cases take a couple of weeks. Something that uh, is important to look at at an early stage is um, do you require for your study an IRT system, an interactive response technology, to manage the allocation of drug to the patient? Do you um, require randomization? Um, do you already have a clear idea? Do you have experience in the IRT field? Um, or do you have um, groups, dedicated groups that are working with this or on this topic? Um, I've seen that very often companies starting here um, again and again um, because people are moving that have maybe previously uh, worked with um, IRT systems, moved into new roles or to new companies. So talk to your vendor, um, ask them for their um, support um, and for their um, advice. They, usually have a lot of experience and looking to a timeline, setting up an IRT system, depending on the complexity of the study, can easily take um, six to eight weeks. So if you don't want to be under extreme pressure, you might um, want to add another two to four weeks just to be on the safe side. If you have a less complex study, maybe you don't need the full blown IRT, but you still want to have full visibility on your inventory that you have at the sites. So an inventory management system might be um, um, a less complex solution, but it still can help you to um, initiate supplies, to, to look at um, your overall drug um, stock um, and to initiate shipments. Another topic that um, very often before you um, look into executing the, the, the filling and, and packaging um, um, tasks um, you're looking at is the whole area of comparator sourcing. Um, with biologics, comparator sourcing has reached a new uh, financial dimension and it can have a huge and significant impact on your study budget. Um, looking into comparators, um, it is important to, to understand, of course, what kind of material you're looking for, but also what you are willing to share, because depending from where you source or what kind of comparator product you're looking at, if you do not disclose the study material uh, details, it will be difficult or more challenging to obtain the required drug and specific documents um, to support, um, for example, the disability data. Um, in which regions do you need to require the supplies to be? Um, again, which countries are involved? Um, a very important point when we talk about comparator sourcing, when we talk about vials, um, and especially pre-filled syringes, is around the whole um, blinding topic. Um, are you able to get the exact material? What is your blinding strategy? Um, so there are a lot of things and if you involve your partner at an early stage, we can say that based on experience, uh, if we have the time to look into the market, we can look like in the example that you see here in the button, we can research if a certain drug is available in a different market. We can provide um, information around it and this can lead to a significant price um, decrease, which given the, the drug price of some of the biological products can again have a significant savings impact on your budget. So when we receive the material from BSM, usually our next step is um, the secondary packaging. We would of course then execute, but before you execute, there are so many other things that you need to, to look at. Um, you need to look at um, how to best protect, protect your product. Uh, what are the requirements? Do you need um, not just shock protection, but maybe also protection from light, from humidity, maybe even during the, the packaging project. 
uh, what kind of components need to be included in um, a drug kit? Is it the drug itself? Um, are there any other um, ancillary supplies, for example, any um, kind of documentation? Um, something that I learned in the past and it was confirmed by colleagues when talking about this and preparing the, the presentation is very often people design kits uh, without thinking about the next step. And I have seen um, kits where um, in the initial discussion um, they were supposed to be 10 to 20 centimeter long. Um, so a specific packaging solution for cold chain distribution was offered, but when the actual um, kits arrived at um, the distribution company, the kits were much larger. And they had to use instead of a 24 liter uh, cold chain shipper, a 96 liter for one kit. And this had a significant price where the um, costs went up for one shipment from approximately five to $600 to over 3000. So be very careful when you um, design um, your kits and also think about the patient that um, he has to handle or she has to handle it um, and you don't want to make it too difficult. Um, any specific materials that are required, are there regulatory um, um, implications that you need to consider? Um, any other um, secondary packaging solution that you, you need to think of? It's a very, very complex topic. And um, the, the next part is um, labeling. And um, very often people say, oh yeah, we need to put the sticker um, on the drug just to comply with the regulatory requirements. But um, the term labeling strategy is not coming from, from nowhere. There is um, a lot of thoughts behind um, what kind of material do you need to have a specific clue, especially when you talk about um, temperature or cold chain conditions, especially when you go into um, ne negative temperature conditions. Um, if you have a plastic container, you need to look um, is there a potential risk that the glue might mitigate through the material, um, which is, for example, something when you look at eye drops, this can be very um, dangerous. Um, then something that has a sick or can have a significant impact on the timeline is the whole topic about translation and regulatory approval. I have seen here turnaround times from a couple of weeks, but also to more than a year. So having um, a clear approach um, and knowing what you need to have on the label is really critical. I will move a little bit faster because I'm of the time. Um, if you are going into different regions, for example, the EU, um, you are facing the topic of um, a qualified person. And as very often the question, okay, is this something I need? Um, larger companies might have set up this process, but if you're working for a smaller um, company or virtual company and you're running your first trial, you might ask yourself, what, what is a qualified person? What is he actually doing? And it's a specific role that is um, existing within the EU that guarantees that any material that is coming into the EU has been processed according CGMP or EU GMP guidelines. Um, and also if a manufacturing step is performed um, in the EU that the material is then released by the QP before it is shipped to the site. Um, overall QPs are, um, I think, uh, a benefit um, as they help to improve quality. But what is important to understand here that before a QP could import or release material, they might actually ask for a supply chain audit. And this, what does it mean? Um, usually you look into the last step of the supply chain from a manufacturing or packaging perspective before the material came into the EU. You might need to look into labs that um, um, performed an analysis of the material that, that is used in the, in the trial. Um, and this is something that can take a lot of time. It's not just the availability of the QP, 
but you need to um, agree on an audit appointment. So the um, potential manufacturing side outside of the EU, the lab, they need to be available. And then there needs to be an, as an audit report that needs to be written. Um, you need to give time to provide an audit response. So there are a lot of um, impacts uh, from a timing perspective. Storage and distribution. Um, this is a, a really complex topic. Um, they, they can uh, change, of course, from um, a country by country perspective. Um, but when we talk about distribution is, of course, um, do you need the depot? Where and how many? Um, the how many has an impact on how many um, stock do you need because every depot will increase also your overage. So usually going with a smaller number of depots unless there is a regulatory requirement um, such as in Brazil, for example, or Argentina where it makes sense to have a depot, you can try to, to limit the number of depots to central ones and then to distribute globally. Um, we mentioned earlier the topic of an import license, uh, what kind of packaging monitoring solution to choose, um, cold chain requirements, um, a lot of different things. What I've seen also very often that uh, the question is asked, do you need return and destruction service? And um, the answer is no. And, and at the later stage in the study, the uh, request is coming, oh, the sites cannot handle this. Can you please also offer return and destruction service? And at the later stage, this can cause some problems of re-exporting drugs um, from a certain country. So it's always good to include this as an early stage in the discussion. So we see that there's a lot of uh, complex supply chain and going briefly over this topic that can easily fill an entire day of discussion. Uh, we hope that uh, moving forward you can simplify it. Um, recommendations uh, really from our side is understanding each other's expectations. Don't just assume something, ask questions, share information. Don't think that the other party already knows about it. Communicate early and often and get your partner involved. Um, you can just benefit from their experience. Yeah? Um, they can help with study plan and design. They can share their experience and help you to um, smoothen the road and to have a soft ride while you develop your clinical supply chain. And with that, I um, hand it over back to Shemaya for the question and answer session. Fantastic. Thank you, Sasha and Andrew, for that very interesting and detailed presentation. So that does bring us to our Q&A portion, audience members. So you can still send in questions to Sasha and Andrew right now using that chat box. We did receive some questions already, so I'll start off with the first question. And that question is, does a client have to determine material materials to be used, so stoppers, vials, caps, etc., or will the CMO make recommendations? So that question would be for me. Um, so both are correct. So the client does need to ultimately choose. However, the CMO does often make recommendations for what they currently have in stock or they've used in the past for the change parts, so eliminating that lead time. Great, thank you, Andrew. And our next question is, can I use a contract lab for release testing instead of the CMO's laboratory? Okay, um, yes, that is a yes. Uh, some CMOs have uh, restrictions on that, so you should check uh, with your CMO, but that definitely can be done and has been done. Fantastic. And another question from an audience member, and that question is, can Berkshire ster Sterile Manufacturing pre-fill unique containers or bags? Um, again, that would be a yes. Um, we currently do syringes, vials, and cartridges. We've done some specialty um, containers as well, um, and we have done some bag filling too. All right, interesting. And we have another interesting question from an audience member. And that question is, how quickly can a new client get on a CMO's fill schedule? So most CMOs book out six to nine months. So that's what you should be prepared to listen to or hear. But what I recommend is to contract with them and get on their wait list. So if there's a cancellation, and many times there are, especially if uh, it's a clinical phase CMO, 
um, you can slip into that spot that becomes available. Fantastic. And our another question from an audience member, that question is, does BSM allow clients to watch their for formulation and fill, or has this changed has this changed as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, so uh, Berkshire Sterile has uh, cameras set up in all of the clean rooms so you can watch remotely, and we've expanded that technology since COVID-19. And we encourage and almost insist that clients be a part of that process. Okay, great. Another question from an audience member, and that question is, do you provide formulation free, freeze dryers? Uh, so we do have lyophilization capabilities here at Berkshire Sterile. We're um, doing an expansion, which will expand that. So currently we offer clinical, and in 2022, beginning of 2022, we'll have commercial um, capacity for that in terms of about 30,000 10R vials. Great, thank you, Andrea. Another question from an audience member. Do you do in-house sterility testing? So we currently outsource, for Berkshire Sterile, we currently outsource uh, to SGS. However, we will be bringing that in-house next year with a sterility isolator from Fedigari. Great, thank you, Andrew. We're getting lots of interesting questions, just making sure that I'm getting to all of them. But it seems like that's all we have for today. So thank you very much for all of those answers, Andrea. And, um, everyone for sending in those questions as well. We reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. If you couldn't attend to your questions, the, te the team at Sharp Clinical and Berkshire uh, may follow up with you after this presentation as well. So if you have further qu questions or comments, you can direct them to the contact information showing on your screens right now. So go ahead, quickly jot them down. And just wanted to thank everyone again for participating in today's webinar and you will be receiving a follow-up email from XSOX with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our future webinars. Now I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share the link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. Now, please join us in thanking Sasha Sonnenberg and Andrea Wagner for that fantastic presentation. On behalf of the team at XTalks, we thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye for now.